Hey, welcome back to Bullpen Sessions. My name is Andy Neary. Each week, I sit down with abundant thinkers who are kicking ass in life. And we deconstruct the formulas they have used to have success in business and in life to help you unpack your life, your business, so you can do the same. So put a smile on, grab a pen and a paper, get ready to take a ton of notes because you, my friend, are about to go on a wild ride. Here we go. Hey, hey, welcome back to Bullpen Sessions. I'm excited this week to sit down with Marshall McFadden. He's got a really cool story. As you know, uh, one of my goals here is to make a bigger impact uh, on younger athletes, uh, make an impact on those athletes who are transitioning from whether it's a college career, professional career in sports, and now they're trying to move on to the second phase of life. And so this episode is definitely fits that mold. Um, some of you may know the name Marshall McFadden. He spent a couple years in the NFL playing for the Pittsburgh Steelers, the Oakland Raiders, the St. Louis now Los Angeles Rams. So he had successful uh, career in the NFL, but here's what's even cooler. He now has a successful career in NASCAR. That's right, NASCAR. You see, Marshall McFadden traded his NFL cleats for a gas tank, lug nuts, and now he's working in the pit crew for the Chip Ganassi racing team. So for the NASCAR fans out there, Chip Ganassi represents Kurt Busch, represents Matt Kenseth, amongst uh, a few other drivers in their stable. And Marshall McFadden's part of the pit crew. I had a chance to meet Marshall a few weeks ago at an event I did, a men's retreat, where we got the chance to watch the Chip Canassi pit crew team work as one well-oiled machine. We got to meet with uh, Marshall and his teammates, and it was just fascinating. So I wanted to have Marshall on the episode to talk about, number one, his rise to NFL stardom. You know, see, Marshall came from a small town, South Carolina, played at a very small high school where you don't get a lot of attention. Then he moved on to South Carolina State, not a big name, not South Carolina Gamecock, South Carolina State, where he didn't get a lot of attention, but it was an interesting conversation he had with a Pittsburgh Steelers scout that changed everything for him. I'm excited to share that conversation with you. And it, it ultimately led him to playing on the NFL fields on Sundays. And so he knew what it took to overcome adversity, overcome doubters when you're not getting the attention you deserve. And he always found a way to show up when it mattered most. And now he's doing that uh, as part of the pit crew and the Chip Canassi racing team. Look, get this. These guys have to pit a car, change four tires, fill the, uh, the, the gas tank with gas, all in under 12 seconds. So we're going to talk about that as well. So this is exciting because Marshall McFadden has had NFL success, and now he's having success off the field in a completely different sport, the sport of NASCAR racing. So I'm excited to bring this conversation to you. This is exactly what Bullpen Session is about, athletes who have excelled on the field and athletes now who are excelling in other areas of life. All right, here we go to today's episode. Shift your mindset. Marshall McFadden, welcome to Bullpen Sessions. How are you today? I'm great, man. Can't complain. Can't complain. Great day so far. Awesome. Uh, I'm excited for this episode. If you're listening in, uh, Marshall's had quite a career uh, yeah, in sports, oh, yeah. two very different sports that you probably think would never go together. Um, but yeah. Marshall's now uh, competing in a second sport at, at an elite level as well. And I'm excited to talk about that. So a lot of people may know the name Marshall McFadden, uh, obviously spent time playing in the NFL. But why don't we take it all the way back, Marshall, to, you know, your childhood in South Carolina growing up? Um, what was the early life of, of Marshall McFadden like? Well, I mean, just like, you know, a lot of, you know, uh, players that came up, especially African-Americans, I think I should throw that out there, that uh, just had to struggle, especially with single parents, you know, growing up with a single parent mom, you know, she did, she did what, uh, what else she could do. And uh, fortunately for me, you know, as I got older, I had uh, Kathy and Joe Gaynor to come into my life. You know, because uh, not because of the athletic ability, uh, you know, what I did on the football field, because I wasn't there on that type of level yet. But they just seen a good person, a good kid that uh, was trying, trying, trying his best. And fortunately, they was able to help me, you know, as I grew into a young man. And uh, I, apply, I, I apply that to them. And, you know, it was a mediocre high school guy, you know, going through, uh, you know, school, you know, wasn't a big time athlete, you know, but was a guy that always just work hard and, you know, just try to keep up with the rest. Well, I know you heard it saying before and everybody else did, you know, 
hard work does plays off. And um, and you are, be, you are, you know, what you hang around. I was hanging around a lot of guys that would start athlete and had that potential. And I always dreamed and, and wanted to be on the same level as them. And I always figured out how can I, you know, get to that point where I kind of had, you know, didn't have the head start where they had father figures that was able to teach them at a young age, uh, throwing the football or playing basketball and even understanding the game. You know, so once I got to a point where I was able to start learning myself, you know, especially in high school, now I started to kind of use my ability along with the hard work. And uh, when I, even when I became a senior in uh, high school, I started to develop a, who is this kid? Who is this guy? Because I never had the household name. And people were starting to see a little bit, you know, uh, uh, what type of player I could be or I could become. Wasn't getting a lot of college scholarships at the time, but at the end of my high school, uh, high school, I was selected to a North South All Star game, and they had co- college coaches and stuff like that. Let me backtrack a little bit because I did go to a one eight, one eight, one eight school where you had about twenty two players on the team. When my senior class, we graduated like fifty three people in my senior class, so it was a very, very, very small school. And uh, you didn't have a lot of scouts to come out there and see, you know, 20 people play, you know, uh, 20 people play. They'll go to the 5A schools, the 4A schools, you know, so on and so on. But uh, at the end of the year, I did get selected to the North South All-Star game. And I'm not going to go into a long story, but the, at the end of that North South game, I was the MVP. And you had, wow. school, you had people from 5A schools, 4A schools. And, and then after that, scholarships started to roll in. I wasn't aware of like colleges, you know, because from my background, my family, nobody never went to college or, you know, so I wasn't aware. So what I did is I was like, all right, and I'm getting college letters from, from every, from, from each and every direction. But what I did, I was like, well, I'm going to go where my friends going. And all the, all the seniors that I played with that year, they all went to South Carolina state because their stuff was limited not mine, but I was like, I'm going with these guys. And, you know, when you build a bond and such and stuff. So I went to South Carolina State, small school, HBCU, and not knowing that I could have went to a Maryland or a, a Carolina or a Clemson, and I would have just been on a bigger scale. That's well, interesting. That, that's well, if I could stop you quick, because yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to ask you that question of, you know, we'll get to your, your, your yeah, uh, NFL was, career as well. You look back, especially when you come from a small school, and I, I was going to ask you, do you look back and say, man, I could have played at South yeah. Carolina. I could have played a heck. It could have been Clemson back then. I don't know. But in that case, you just didn't even know what you didn't I, know. I, I, I just I just knew what I knew, you wow. know, and, and, and uh, that's how that situation came about. And I remember asking my uncle, I mean, have no clue about football, never played. And I'm like, man, this, this, uh, I'm like, man, this school, he was like, ah, that's in the mountains. You no, know, you don't want to go up there. So I'm like, all right, that's out. <laughs> you know? But then again, I don't think anybody knew that the potential I had at the time, they knew I was a good player, but they didn't think that I was going to be on that scale in the next th- four or five years. They had a clue. So I'm not saying they didn't take it serious. But they look like, ah, oh, man, Smir- uh, Marshall getting a scholarship, good for him, pat on the back. Do you nah. think, let me ask you a big question. Did you know you had the talent and the ability? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. And, uh, you know, I, I still think about this to this day, where I come from and e- even what I was able to accomplish in high school, knowing that I was playing on a smaller scale, I had no idea. It never crossed my mind that I would be able to play for one on a college level, but for two on the NFL level, it never crossed my mind. And I know we'll get to that point, but it was one particular moment when I, I had to sit down and breathe like, wow, I got an opportunity. Well, absolutely. A couple of things, uh, you know, that I think of is number one, it's interesting because it, it's it, kids. You look at kids today that are athletes and the ones mm-hmm. that go on to play at the collegiate level today. Nowadays they're, they're on travel teams. This journey has been kind of planned out. Uh, oh. Parents have, let's be honest, parents have spent a lot of money uh, oh, making sure they're getting the attention. Yours was the exact opposite. You didn't, was- you didn't, you didn't know what you didn't know. You didn't know you yeah. maybe had the talent to play. It just all of a sudden your senior year after literally one game. <sighs> yeah. 
yeah. it hit you that holy crap, there's a yeah. chance. Yeah. There's and a chance. here's why I love that story, Marshall, is my journey is similar in that fashion. Now, this is what I want to hear. Because playing at my senior year of high school, I'm a pitcher. I was five foot nine. Not, you know, didn't throw over par. I just wasn't recruited heavily. I had, I had accepted one scholarship to a division wow. one school or division division two school, excuse me. Okay. But what happened was I had a playoff game my senior year starting the, you know, starting pitcher that night. And I had one chance to prove it to a division one school. Cause that night the UWM Uni university of Wisconsin, Milwaukee coaching staff was there. So I had one last chance. Right. And that night I threw a one hitter. And that's what got me the opportunity to go play at UWM. Yours was very similar. You literally went. Your season had ended. You yep. literally went into the all-star game, which I know up in Wisconsin usually was during the summer. I don't know if they did that in, in South Carolina too. No, but, no. But you had one game, one last game to prove yourself, and you did. Yep. Yep. That is such a cool story. Now, <laughs> here's, here's the question I want to ask you. Growing up the child of a single parent, you know, is there anything you learned that you still either apply today or helped you on the football field that you learned from watching your mom? Well, I, I, I do. And I, and I, and, and, um, and I do thank her, you know, you know, the pre appreciate her for what she could, what she could, what she done for us. You know, she yeah. did all she could, you know, and don't, you know, but at the end I had some takeaways from that. Cause sometimes when you go through obstacles and obstacles in life, such as, Football. Football is a physical sport and you got to train and, and, and most people overtrain. Well, you go through in some situations where you think about giving up in football, you know, because you're going to play against guys bigger, stronger, faster. And uh, especially as a kid, because sometimes kids, kids mature faster than other kids. You could be a, a sophomore in high school and still only 170 pounds. But the point that I'm trying to get at it, it are times out there where you just don't have anything left. and You just want to walk away. For one, you feel like you can't compete. And for two, I mean, ain't nobody really going to help you unless you help yourself. But I always go back to that moment where I did have a single parent mom. Uh, she was making minimum wages and she had to carry five kids. And I think that, you know, when you're going through things, if somebody can endure that and, and, and her kids can be successful, such as, such as me, now don't get me wrong. As I got older, I had, I had help along the way, and they helped me out in a major way. And I always, you know, Kathy Gaines and Joe Gaines, my pops and my mom. But just to look back on my at the beginning stage, and I can take away from that is if she can do it, why not? I, why not yeah. me? You know, why yeah. not? Why not take that motivation with you? Because I think her struggles and her pain was a lot harder than mine. And I'm just out here on the football field, just getting winded. You know, so sometimes you just take those situations with you and they can get you out of the toughest moment. And that's just one of the takeaways that I can take from that. And it's a lot more that I learned from situations from, from her, from my upbringing. Well, and again, I, I love hearing these stories because I often tell people I don't have those stories. I came my, my childhood was easy. My parents mm -hmm. were great both yep. teachers. Uh, I'd consider myself the definition of average. Like I don't have that story, but one thing I love, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk says it all the time. The one reason he feels he's so successful today is he come, he came from the dirt. He came yeah. from tough beginnings. He knows what it's like to be there. And yeah. that's now his competitive advantage. Oh man. That's, and that's so for you, here you are now at South Carolina state. So I love your story. You go from super small high school. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Now you're getting playing at the next level of the collegiate level, but South Carolina state's not a big school. It's an it's, HBCU. Yeah. Yeah. It, Tell me what it was like when you got there and now uh, you realized you're playing the game at a, a completely different level. Well, obviously when I was getting recruited, obviously they're recruiters. They tell you anything. So it was like, Oh man, you're going to be a great player for us. Yada, yada. But when I got to South Carolina state, guess who I was, I was on the back of the totem pole, just another guy with a number. And um, they gave me some hard, but I think I was like number 50 something, you know, I wasn't a cool guy and not knowing, obviously there's a hundred, hundred players on the team. So they tell you things just to get you in. And once I got in and once I signed on the dotted line, when I got there, I would, like I said, I was just another name and until I was able to prove, prove myself. But now I'm in this big world. I'm by myself, no family, no friends. I'm off to college. And, and once again, this is HBCU. 
So it wasn't like Clemson or Notre Dame or Florida State it was like, oh man, you there? You about to go to the you about to go to the NFL because I went, but I didn't go there. So it was just me, just you know, just filling it out and trying to figure it out. And when I got there, I quickly saw that this is not going to be easy. You know, I got my work cut out for me. And uh, I just remember we was at practice one day. And obviously I'm on the sideline because, you know, you have your seniors and your juniors and your red shirt freshmen, all of that stuff. I was just on the sideline. And uh, obviously the guy, the two guys that was in front of me, they wasn't getting the job done. And I had coach end up getting upset with these guys. One of them was a senior and another one was a, like a, a red shirt junior. And they wasn't getting the job done. And then coach said, Marshall, I'm like, okay, I got this big jersey. I'm coming out there flapping. I'm coming out there flapping. And so they ran the they ran a play. The first play when I got in, I'm nervous. I got, I'm I'm a seniors, you know, I'm 175 pounds. I'm like, oh God. So <laughs> so uh, they the first play, they ran it directly at me. And it was a, like an ISO play. And the fullback came towards me. So I had to take on this big, mean, scary fullback. And so we met. I blew this fullback up, man. Blew him up and made a tackle in the backfield. Coach, the head coach, like, oh, God. What the, hey, who is that guy? Who is that? He said, run it again. He said, run it again. And that very next play, they ran it at me. I done exactly the Blew the guy. The guy, he mad. He angry. Now, I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> so they run it back at me because I embarrassed the guy and the exact the same thing happened. And from that on, I never I I, I was in that spot until I left there. That I was, was gonna my, say, I was, was that was that your defining moment when you're like, that, Yeah, I belong here. That was my I didn't really know yet. I didn't know what okay. I was doing, but coaches them like this guy is a player. And guess what? The senior that was the senior that was in front of me in the in the red shirt junior. You know, I felt bad for those guys because they worked so hard to get to that point. But at the end of the day, this is a business. And those guys respected the fact that this is a really good player and he can help our ball club. And it was it was a smooth transition for me. I started as a true freshman and I end up gaining a nickname called the natural. You know, just a guy that just came in and started making plays. And that's, I, awesome. it, it, that's how and that's how things started happening for me. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know how I did it. It just, it just happened. You know, I'd love your perspective on this. And for those listening in, if you're not familiar with what Marshall's referencing when he says HBCU, that's historically black colleges and universities. Yes, sir. Right. Yes. Yep. And so here you are proving that almost sounded like a remake of the movie, Rudy. Like you put Rudy in, <laughs> he blows up like, who, yeah. what? Yeah. Yeah. And, and what would you tell a, a high school football player today? Because I think something that impacts young athletes today, and, that, and I don't necessarily like it, is they go to college because they're so hyped these days with these expectations. Yeah. And if they don't walk in their freshman year with a starting gig, they transfer, they're out. Or yeah. some yeah. people quit. Yeah. What advice would you give that kid who hasn't experienced what life is going to be like at the collegiate level? They might be dominating the, you know, the, the, the football field in their small town. What advice would you give that kid right now to be prepared and ready for what life's going to be like at the collegiate football level? Or for me, I tell a high school, high school kid from me to them is, yep. and I think you hit it on the head. Don't believe the hype because sometimes parents and relatives can, hype a kid up so much and spoil them to a certain extent to make them out to be something they're not, you know? And I, when I go to these schools, I tell, I tell people is, especially kids, you work hard and you're pretty good in the little division you're playing in. But do you understand it's a million more people across the world doing exactly the same thing. And sometimes when mommy and dad are not pulling on their coat, coattail anymore and they're in a the college atmosphere, and they got to, and they and their seniors and, and, and red shirt freshmen and red shirt juniors, juniors and sophomores. And those guys just as good as good, 10 times better than they are. And some kids that can't maneuver through that because of the confidence level, they never had to endure that, endure that before. They lose confidence and they transfer, they drop out. They're not performing at the level that it was supposed to because of all what happened back at home. So, I always tell people to, to humble yourself, you know, and don't yep. feed up into the hype. And I just think people that don't fit kids that don't feed up into the hype, they can go to a college level, understand that role because you don't want to, you don't want to rush it. 
you know, do what the program wants you to do. And trust me, they they want to win as as more as you want to win. Just go there or abide by the laws, and you'll become a great player, whether you want to or not. But if you find find those rules, humble yourself, and uh, it'll make a difference, you know, for a kid. Because once again, before you hit on it, kids get spoiled with the stuff that with the traveling ball and the nice clothes and you know they, they put rankings on people and stuff like that and they feed into that yeah Not absolutely I, I think what you said hit it I remember playing at UWM and and the biggest change I saw whether an a, a kid a kid continued to excel at the collegiate level or they phased yeah. out they burned out number one time management you know, when you're in high school, everything's done for you all time. Everything's organized. You go to school, you go to class, you go right to practice, you come home, do your homework, go to bed. College, you have more time. So time management's always an issue. How are you using the time you have? Number two, it's the realization that guess what? Every kid on this team was a high school all-star. Oh man. Oh man. And, and yeah. are you okay with that? Can you step up to that? Yeah. Or are you going to back down? Cause now you're no longer the top man on the total boat. Yeah. 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 So your story, I'm starting to get the, uh, the 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 theme of the story here. High school, you have that one big moment, an all-star game. You take advantage of it. It ended up landing you at South Carolina State, yeah. standing on the sidelines. First two guys on the uh, depth chart don't do their job. You come in. You absolutely blow people away. So here you are, <laughs> freshman year, starting at South Carolina. And for those that don't know, Marshall played linebacker. Yeah. yeah. Was there a moment then at South Carolina State where you're like, Wait a second. I think I can actually take this to the next level. Yep, I will, I, I would be glad about to, that. I'd be glad to share that with you. Similar to your story, almost. Well, at a HBCU, smaller school, and sometimes we we play bigger schools, not because to compete in it, which it could be, but we play it for money. You know, it's a money payoff for the college. You know, to support the, all other sports program as well. We don't go to a game thinking we're going to win, which we know that playing against a team like Clemson, it's a slim chance. There's a slim chance that we'll, you know, get the win, you know, but we go in there with pride. And uh, we, ha we had uh, Clemson on the schedule this year. And, um, and uh, we had to go in, we had to go in the battle. Just don't care, big, small, fast, slow. But, you know, as a team, as your brothers, you go in and end up the battle. And that is exactly what I did. You know, now we got beat 52 to zero, whatever the score, whatever the score was. But I went in there with the mindset is that, hey, these are my brothers and I'm, I'm, I'm going to fight with them. And and uh, the score didn't indicate my performance, you know, and during that Clemson game as a linebacker playing against C.J. Spiller and, you know, all these uh, Jacoby Ford, uh, uh, Davis and all these guys, you know. I was able to stand up to the occasion and, and put on a pretty good performance. And not only that, scouts was scouts was there. And so um, I guess they kept uh, track of the games I played in that year. I guess I became on the radar. And that following year, when I was eligible, I was a junior next year. And um, I was at practice, not knowing that I, not knowing that I can was going to make it to that level yet, but I was at practice and just hanging out. And obviously this was like, uh, doing like the, the training camp, the training camp or whatever. And I was at practice, but I wasn't playing because I dislocated, I dislocated my wrist and I was out for the season, but the scouts didn't know that at the time, but I was, I was at practice just chilling, hanging out. And, and somebody came and tapped me. He had on, he had on all this Pittsburgh still and stuff. And he was like, uh, you Marshall McFadden. And I was like, uh, he was like, uh, I come here to see you. Like me? He was like, uh, yeah, he was like, I'm Dan Rooney, uh, head scout for the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I was like, what? And so we just had a conversation. He was like, well, I come to see you. And obviously, you're not even dressed out to do anything, so I can't see you. So let's let's talk. So we talked a little bit, and he was like, uh, he mentioned the game against Clemson. He was like, I thought you was a physical downhill player. You was doing some things that a lot of linebackers can't can't do. And I think you a second round draft pick. And when he told, he think I, he said, I think you could be a second round draft pick. And I was like, yeah. And that's the moment I was like, wow, I got a chance to play in the NFL. And it just brung, you know, even though I didn't play that year, you know, I was able to come back from that and uh have a pretty good season. And believe it or not, you know, that's when my season was done and over with, when it was an opportunity for me to play at the next level, that same guy came back and put in, uh, gave me a workout with the Pittsburgh Steelers. And um, 
I was able I, I was able to get on that roster. And my first year with them to play, my first game was a Thursday night game against the Baltimore Ravens. And uh, it was just, uh, it was awesome. And my journey kind of went from there. But that's the moment I knew uh, that I was able to play at the next level. There's so many parallels right now, Marshall, that I didn't expect in this conversation because I can remember my senior year at UWM. I I didn't think, again, based on my size, I didn't throw yeah. overly hard. I didn't throw 95 miles an hour. I'm like, you know, here's my senior year. It'd be nice if I had a chance at the at the next level, but honestly, I don't think I'm going to get there. I mean, that, that's how, truly how I was feeling, and it was when my pitching coach, who had played in the major leagues with the oh, Baltimore yeah. Orioles and the Philadelphia Phillies, said, okay. "Hey, man, like if you can get if you if you can accomplish these couple things this year, you're probably going to get signed." And it was the moment he said that it it was like it clicked like you just had when, when Dan Rooney said, by the way, I think you're a second round pick. All it takes is somebody who's been there, the credibility, yep. right. Of saying, yep. I've been there, I've seen it and you've got it. Yep. Boom. Boom. It just takes yep. your mental ability, your mental capacity to the next level. And then it just yep. shows itself in what you do on the field. That's awesome. It, so yeah, go ahead. But it, but now yeah it did man and um and don't get me wrong it wasn't all peaches and cream for me in college and I, I don't want people to think that oh man Marshall went out here he did this and he did that and he was great no I had two season I had two season in the injuries in college as well you know one was in two thousand and in two thousand and seven and another one was in two thousand and nine you know uh, dislocated my elbow put me out for the season and dislocated my wrist so. I had my battles and I had my battles called, uh, cut out for me. And, you know, I could have laid there, stayed down and, and, and weep, but I was, I was able to come back and it just made me stronger. Every battle that I ever been through, I just came back stronger. And, uh, it just shows my character, show who I, who I was, you know, just to come back and say that I belong here and I'm going to help my teammates do whatever I do in the classroom and on the field. And uh, it, it just it just ended up working in my benefit, man, just overcoming the obstacles that I had. Because like I said, I always reflect back to the single single mom. And if, if she can endure it, you know, this stuff is easy. And I just uh, I just took that with me. And uh, I, I got an opportunity in the NFL and, you know, took advantage of that situation and able to play for uh, three years. Able was uh, with Pittsburgh, Oakland and Rams, you know, uh, take three years to retire. You know, so I was uh, had a couple of injuries you know, in the NFL with the hip surgery with Pittsburgh and a couple of groins and stuff like that. But I was able to walk away from the game healthy. You know, I was able to retire, you know, something that uh, my kids can be proud of their dad of, when, you know, as they get older and, and so on and so on. And uh, that just kind of, that just how that journey journey went for me. And uh, it, it, it was a blessing at the end of the day, especially where I come from. So let's let's put a bow on this part of your career. And if you can, I'm going to put you on the spot. If you can put this in one sentence, one statement, starting at playing at a very small school in South Carolina at the high school level, playing at a smaller HBCU school in college. And then here you are playing on the footballs, the world's biggest stage in football. And with one of the most historic teams in the NFL, the Pittsburgh Steelers, if you could all crunch that all down into one statement, what do you think allowed you? What is it you did that allowed you to, excel at all of those levels well one thing that i always had was confidence i was always confident in myself you know no matter you know what i've been through or what i had you know i was always a confident confident guy but uh i don't think i would have got that that's that thus far if it wasn't for the hard work that i put in i never i didn't have i wasn't the biggest wasn't the fastest wasn't the strongest but the work that I put in to put myself in position to take advantage of the opportunities. And uh, I'm going to just keep it simple. It's hard work pays off. And that's a true statement. That's awesome. I mean, that's, I just put a post out today on social media about what, what work are you putting in when no one's watching? That, that's what it all comes down to. So, so here's why I have you on the podcast. This is the next part of your story, which I absolutely love. I love talking to athletes who excelled at the highest level. Yes, sir. And now career's over and they're excelling at something else. Now you are still in the world of sports, I am, but not yes. something people probably would have expected as you're part of the pit crew on the Chip Ganassi racing team, which is, which is such a cool thing. You and I got a chance to meet a few weeks back. How did that happen? How does a former NFL player end up on a NASCAR pit crew? 
man, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, man. Even after the NFL, I went, I went to play in Canada for two years, you know, so I went to play for the Toronto Argonauts for a while and, and suffered some injuries over there. And uh, that's when I really decided to hang the cleats up. And I, as I was driving home from Canada, after I decided not to play anymore, as I was driving back to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, the only thing I was thinking about, like, man, what I'm going to do next? Or what I'm going to do next? And uh, as I got home in that first year, it was, it was a little different because I was working with the NFL, uh, uh, trying to find my niche of what I wanted to do. And, you know, I, um, you know, playing football since you five years old and, and now – you you 30, 30 years old and and this is your first time really actually being in the real world where you you have to figure it out and you got so much time you don't have that time when you you know in high school college pro you know because meetings and and practices and workouts and traveling and, and you you've been, you've been doing that all your life so now you get home the world actually slows down for you where you waking up and you don't got a clock in for a workout. You don't got to clock in for a meeting. Like some people, a lot of guys go through, you know, that uh, 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 a rough stage. I don't want to say, I want to, you know, because some guys excel at uh, like me, but it was, I say it was different. It was different for me that I had to get accustomed to, you know, I'm a regular civilian now. And, you know, I got to adapt to the everyday, everyday world. And I'm not saying that it was easy, but I was, taking the right steps to uh, put myself in a situation to find out something that I like and I can do and I can enjoy as much as I did with football. And I'm, so I'm trying all these different things, maybe trying to coach and uh, I was a manager at FedEx and just, just put my hand in a lot of different things. And one day uh, a mutual friend of mine, he was like, Hey man, you should come check out uh, NASCAR's right up the street. Cause he was working there at the time. And I was like, I don't know nothing about NASCAR, but uh, I'll go check it out. You know? So I, uh, I went out there and obviously you met Pete, uh, Mike Metcalf, yep. uh, Sean Pete, Mike Metcalf. So I go out there, you know, I'm this big NFL guy and, you know, I see all these guys. There's about 20, about 25 guys and obviously the two coaches. So I'm, as I'm looking, I'm like, wow, these guys are really performing as a team. And then I started noticing the camaraderie, guys cutting jokes, playing. And I was like, wow, this reminds me of the locker room. Like, OK, you know something? After that practice, I said, I'm going to come back. And talking to Sean and Mike, they was like, yeah, man, come back. So I found time in my schedule to keep going to their practices. And one day, you know, uh, I was out there and obviously just now I'm kind of seeing what's going on. It's fun. I'm, I'm getting I'm learning guys' names. And one day, Coach Pete was like, Marsha, get in there. I was like, me? He was like, yeah, grab a can. So uh, a gas can is what I gassed the car with. So I grabbed the, I, I, I grabbed the can and, you know, I did the best of my ability to, to, to make sure it was right. And it was a little shaky, but it was okay. But after that practice, Sean Pete and uh, Mike Metcalf called me to the office. They was like, hey, Marshall, because they didn't see so many people come and go because they didn't, it's a, it's a process. You ain't just going to come in and, and get it like that. And they want to see character. They want to see who this person is when nothing is on the line, no money, no anything. They just want to know what type of human being that we possibly could be signing here. And uh, one day they called me in the office. It was like, Marsha, if you're serious about this situation, you know, down the line, that could be a contract waiting for you. You know, and I was like, yeah, man, I like it. I like what's going on. I like what's going, in, going on here because of the, the workouts, the, the treatment, the, the trainers and, and so on and so on. So eventually I kept going, kept going. And that following year, I ended up getting a contract. And I'm in, and now after this weekend, I finished up my third year at Chip Ganassi Racing. That's awesome. So it's funny because, you know, when we came to the the headquarters there to learn a little bit about more what more about what you guys are doing, you know, it's, it was a little surprising at first. You're like, wait a second, it's a, a whole pit crew full of athletes, basically, right? And uh -huh. and I I think a lot of people listening in might think NASCAR and they think the pit crew is made up a bunch of, uh, of a bunch of car mechanics, <laughs> but that's not the case, right? NASCAR is actually yeah. trending in a new direction where they're looking yes, for athletes, correct? Yes, sir. The times, the times uh, with a pit start are extremely fast. Now you talk about changing four tires, a uh, full tank of gas and make adjustment uh, under 12 seconds. <laughs> you know, that's, that's impressive. And you got no room for error. You know, and so how you make those time faster, you go and get faster people. 
So who you target? You target college, NFL, baseball, uh, basketball. You target, you know, the elite players. And that's what NASCAR trended to. Now they're hosting combines, you know, for guys to come in and pit a car. You know, so you're exactly right. <laughs> it's trending with, you know, a lot of a lot of athletes in the pit crew area. That's uh, interesting. I'm curious. So you you guys heard him right. They changed four tires, uh, put gas in, all in under 12 seconds. Yeah. Um, I got a, I got the chance to experience this, and and we had a team <laughs> competition at our best, just to let everybody know and put this in perspective. I think we hit 30 seconds was yeah. what was our was our best yeah. time, and they're doing it under 12. Yeah. Um, but here you got you know. Marshall, you've got, what is it? About six, seven guys around a vehicle Mm -hmm. in a very intense situation. Yeah. What, what does it require? What teamwork is required? What skills does that team have to have? uh, Camaraderie does that team have to have to be able to pull off that type of change with tires, with gas in under that, you know, in under 12 seconds in such intense um, situation, what does it take? What does that team have to have? Well, the first thing you got to have is uh, that brotherhood. Everybody got to be in sync because, you know, you can't do one job without the other. So one thing we teach, one thing we teach is here. One thing I think the first thing Mike and Pete does is just hire the right people, you know, with the right people that can understand, you know, people who they're working with. And and then not, not only that, hiring people that uh, don't care about what college you went to or, you know, uh, what you've done in life, but hiring people that you know, they're going to get the job done in the right way. You know, so, so you already walking into, you know, a program that's already built, you know, for success. And, uh, and once the people, once the the people get there, now you got to be in tune with yourself and you got to be in tune with your teammate. And now with that being said, you can build that chemistry, you know, with what they already got built at that program. Building chemistry with your with your teammate is one of the best things that you can have in NASCAR because everything is so in, uh, in sync. You know that the the changers got to know when the jack man got a, uh, got a good peg, and the, the jack man got to know when the changers got all five lug nuts tight. The gas man got to understand when the changers come around the car so he can unplug and then plug again. So all of this tie into to one another to make eleven second stop and that take practice practice you know going out to eat with your buddy getting to know that person know their strengths and weaknesses and that's what we teach at our program and, and i think that's one reason why we're so successful as a pit crew team and i think what's so amazing is in that sport the difference between first and ninth place which is the difference between millions of dollars is yeah. not even a second in some not cases even, not even not even a second in some cases it, just, wow. it, it it could take a split second you know to go from first to tenth split second imagine that wow <laughs> you know you're talking about pressure so now that you're you're you've you're you're having fun you're living life loving life as a pit crew member here 3 4 years beyond the NFL career what advice would you give an athlete who you know I think you said it so well the sport defined your life yeah and then and then one day it's over and I think what's interesting you retire but I remember when I was let go by the Brewers my last vision of professional baseball was somebody literally telling me I'm no longer good enough to play what advice would you give a, a, an athlete that's in that moment right now? They're ready. They're, they're, they're trying to move on to the next chapter after, after the sports career is over or, or whatever that might be. What, what have you learned now in this transition to the career you find yourself in the NASCAR circuit? Well, uh, this what I tell, this what I tell anybody and even, and even my two sons is that uh, sports in general don't last, don't, don't last forever. I don't care if it's baseball, basketball, football, NASCAR, you know, and so on and so on. Eventually, one day, as as an as an athlete, you got to walk away from the game, and it, it may be in high school, it may be in college, it may be in pro, but at the end of the day, it is what it is, and you got to move on with life. So, what I like to tell people is that you know, find something else that you you know enjoy, you know, and on your free time when you're not playing football or you're in the off season, you know, figure it out, prepare yourself for the future. You know, because football, the average year in football is two years. You got a whole nother 40 years to live. 
you know, 60, 60 years to live, 70. So find find something that you like so you can enjoy and you can create, you know, a path for you and your family. You know, and I, I think that's where I take it. You know, find something else that you enjoy that'll get you up every morning out of bed, you know, and you can be successful at because you'll be surprised how much happier you can be outside of playing a sport. And, uh, and uh, I played at the highest level, but the point I am my, at the point that I am at now, man, I'm happier than I ever been in life. And uh, it just feel good going to sleep at night and waking up in the morning, knowing that I have that, you know, happiness because, you know, I'm able to learn and figure out other avenues that going on and going down, you know, in the future. That's it's awesome. Yeah. That, that's so, it's, it's so important because I think you're right. The, the sport becomes the identity. The other thing about athletics that people don't understand to your point, you were retired out of football and you were barely 30. Yeah. yeah. You have a whole life to live yet. And I think so many struggle with what's next. They think life is over at that point. And it's like, no, nah. no, no, no. It's just starting. It just started. So let's finish here. A couple of last questions, Marshall. This has been a fun conversation. So thank you for, oh, yeah. for taking the time to be here. Let's go back to the young athletes quick. Cause, cause an audience I want, I like impacting with this podcast is the mm-hmm. young athletes. I think they face, they face different opportunities, different challenges. And you and I did probably when we were kids. That's true. They also have a very big challenge going on right now. And it's this thing called COVID and mm-hmm. their sports are being canceled yeah. they or being altered greatly. It, potentially is costing scholarships. Scholarships are being limited. College teams are, are having to, you know, probably uh, limit budgets in the future. What advice would you give a young athlete right now? Go back to Marshall McFadden, who was 16, 17 years old back in that small town in South Carolina. If you had a chance to sit down with him today, what advice would you give him? Uh, keep working, young man. Uh, no matter the cir- circumstances of the situation, and with the COVID, with how being as serious it is, you gotta be you gotta be safe. And and but you can be safe and still put the work in as an athlete. Because in the athlete, the ultimate goal is to be better than the guy in front of you, behind you, or beside you. And you're not gonna get that done, you know, by sitting in the house because there is a a COVID and it is putting limited scholarships and it is budgeting. You gotta find ways to make yourself you know, just as better the next guy that got all those tools, you know? So uh, I just think you got to just take advantage. And and even in some cases, this is your, this is your opportunity to take advantage, you know, of the situation that's going on and get ahead of some guy. So if, if I was talking to my six, 16 year old self, I would just say, man, like I said before, hard work pays off, you know, take advantage of what's put, what's, the, what's put in front of you. No, I agree. And I want to add there, nobody owes you anything. Don't have any expectations, work your butt off. It's that simple. And I think, Marshall, you are a a sign of somebody who took advantage of every situation. Let's face it, at South Carolina State, when the the first string, second string linebackers didn't do their job, you stepped in and did, and the rest is history. And the same thing is true at the NFL level. I'm sure the same thing goes on at at, at, uh, the Chip Canassi headquarters. I mean, when you were there, part of 25 guys trying out, Yes, I'm sure others gave up, others failed. You yep. stepped up when you had your chance. And that's what life's all about is stepping up in the moment when you are given your chance because you don't know how many chances you're going to get. I couldn't have said it any better. I couldn't so, have said it any better. So Marshall, if somebody wanted to reach out to you, follow you, what are the best ways to do that? Oh, great. Uh, obviously, I have the social media platform and you can follow me at uh, MMCFadden5. You know, that's on, that's on uh, Twitter, Twitter. And that's on my Instagram and obviously Facebook, Marshall McFadden. You can find me there. So if you ever want to reach out or hear, hear, hear a story or if you go into some things and I can give you any kind of advice, reach me on those platforms. And uh, I, 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 that would be great for me. Use me as a sounding board. If I can get you through anything, you know, that would be, uh, be my pleasure. Awesome. And I, I can add to this, having had time, spent time with the, the team there down in uh, Concord, North Carolina. If you are a business and you're looking for a great team building exercise, reach out to Sean <laughs> Pete and I'm going to put it in the show notes. Definitely, reach out to definitely Sean. do that. Yes. Yeah. The, yes. the, 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 the lesson learns, the, the talks that were given, the, the, the whole tour of the headquarters about what goes on behind the scenes at a, at a NASCAR, on a NASCAR team and just watching you guys do what you do is a work of art. So if again, you're a, a team leader looking for a good team building exercise, when 
when we're able to get back and travel and do live things again, you have to look this up. I'm going to put it in the show notes. Uh, this team does a fabulous job. So Marshall, with that being said, man, thanks for your time. Man, I appreciate the opportunity to come on and speak with you and uh, t- tell my story. I appreciate you. Yeah. Yeah, no, man, this has been fun. Anytime I can get an athlete on who has succeeded on the field and is now yes, succeeding sir. off it, in your case, still on it, just on a racetrack, uh, yes, I love having that conversation. So, guys, if you're listening in, I hope this lesson was really simple. Don't expect anything. No one owes you anything. Work your butt off when that moment sure. comes. Don't let it pass. And you know what happens when clarity and confidence collide. Action happens. So go make yes, it sir. happen today. I like it. Hard work pays off. Shift your mindset. Hey, I just want to say thank you for taking the time to listen to this episode. If you're finding bullpen sessions to be valuable to your business and your life, do me a favor. Please go to Apple. Please subscribe. Give it a five-star rating. And if you have anybody else in your life, whether it's in your personal tribe or in your business that could also be impacted by listening to these episodes, do me a favor. Share the bullpen sessions with them. I'd be extremely grateful. And until next time, go out, make it happen today. Put a smile on your face and have some fun.